everybody, welcome to the Portland Puppet User Group. Hey, Charlie. Um, thanks for coming out tonight, we really appreciate it. As you know, we've got pizza. There's also cups there, so if you guys want some beer, there's some back over in the corner, and there's also soda. Uh, most of you have found it, but just in case. Um, and the bathrooms are out across the bridge, across the hall, it's not intuitive. Um, so our first talk tonight is going to be by Alice Nodelman here at Puppet Labs, and she's gonna be talking to you about Beaker and testing tools, and I'm pretty excited, so she can introduce herself in just a minute. And here you go. You don't need this. No, I should be I should be all mic'd up by now. Uh, so yes, I'm going to be covering Beaker Beaker 101. Um, my colleague Hunter is going to be talking after me, uh, and he's going to be covering some extensions to Beaker for Forge module testing. So if you're excited about that, that will be coming a little later in the evening. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to say is, yes, I'm Alice Nodelman in the flesh. It's really me. Uh, I create automation tools. I have for many years at various different companies. Uh, I specialize in creating automated frameworks for difficult to automate conditions, so very specialized setups, um, which is a lot like Puppet. Uh, I can be reached at alicepuppetlabs.com. I'm also active on IRC as a node. Um, there is a, starting to become a more active Beaker community. Uh, they do show up often on Puppet-Dev, um, so feel free to join and talk to me, or uh, I do have notifications every time someone says the word beaker. Um, so please try to be kind, otherwise when I get up in the morning it's a little disappointing. So just, just making sure there. So what is Beaker? Uh, it is a black box acceptance testing tool. It means we don't care at all about any hooks into Puppet itself. Uh, we treat it as an end user would treat it. Uh, so we put it into the system, we test it the way a uh, user sitting at a terminal would test it. It goes through um, probably an important step. Uh, the two major important steps with Beaker are that it provisions, configures, and manages hosts under test. I know people hate it when you read slides, but a little out of practice here. So that means that it will set up the entire testing network for you, ensure that the machines can contact and communicate with each other. Um, it's also capable of doing full PE installations, um, so both Puppet Ent Enterprise and from Git. Uh, it conducts these installations for you, gets it all configured, your masters, your agents, your database, your dashboard, everything good to go. At that point, it can execute your test files. Test files are really simple in plain Beaker. It is just a Ruby file, and what it provides you with is the Beaker DSL, which we're gonna be talking about a little later. So it provides you full access to Ruby, and I know you're all excited Puppet users, so you're very familiar with Ruby, because <laughs> that seems to be what we do everything in. So a DSL, I had to learn this when I started to work at Puppet, is a domain-specific language. So in this case, our domain is Puppet, and so what we're doing is we're wrapping a number of functions and procedures uh, that are useful for testing Puppet into Beaker. Um, so these are mostly speedy shortcuts. Uh, you can install um, Puppet Enterprise simply by writing in install PE. And if your beaker is correctly configured, it will do everything else for you. It generates the answer files, it pushes them to hosts, runs the commands, it does first run, it accepts the certificates. It's just an all-in-one package. Um, so it's a really those types of features. So we also do that in terms of, say, running puppet applies, setting up manifests, those kinds of testing options. So yeah, here I'm uh, gonna encourage you all, if you, I know a lot of you will have computers. <laughs> now maybe not directly at this moment, but in the near future. Uh, you can just do a gem install beaker. Uh, currently requires Ruby 1.8 plus. We'd really love to just jump up to 1.9, uh, but for various internal reasons, we're not allowed to yet. So if you wanna use Ruby 1.8, you are welcome to at this point. So here's the general workflow of how a series of tests operate. So as I was talking about before, the initial step is provisioning your entire network of hosts. So that's setting up your masters, your agents, making sure they can talk to each other. Uh, we do a few validation checks. Um, we want to ensure that you can do things like, um, I feel like this is wobbling in and out. No? Okay. Uh, so that you can do things like, uh, we ensure that curl is there, because that's very important for doing the automated 
certificate signing. Uh, we do things like ensure that NTP date or similar, depending on platform, is there. Um, that's especially if you've done a lot of puppet installations, you know that if you have any time sync issues between machines, you get a failed installation. So we do ensure that uh, the, the, the um, systems under test are properly validated and ready to go. At that point, as I said, you can run those Ruby files, which contain tests, one after the other after the other, uh, report results, and then throw it all away. So that's kind of the general workflow that you're going to be seeing with these testing systems. Um, you know, I come from a QA background originally, so it also is very important to always throw away as frequently as you possibly can. Um, we have a lot of issues with uh, dirty test systems of various types, and then you'll get all kinds of side effects you won't want. So that's another reason, another advantage to have something like Beaker. When you can uh, automate the setup and the teardown, it means that you're more likely to do the teardown and setup frequently. So I was hoping this would show up pretty big. Um, these are command line basics. Speaker has a pretty complicated command line because it does so much stuff. And so what I'm trying to do here is just highlight that if you're a beginner, this is the stuff you're going to be most interested in. Um, I think we did recently change it so that the log level debug is on by default because people were complaining that it's useless without it. So you will, you don't actually have to turn on the log level anymore, <laughs> which is a good thing um, so that you can get a feel for what it's doing at any time. Uh, I'm talking about this preserve hosts and no provision. I have a couple of slides to clear that up. That has to do with how it's setting up and tearing down network after tests. Uh, I think the most important for a new user is this parse only option. Uh, Beaker supports uh, configuration options that come from environment variables, the command line, uh, additional option files. Uh, it, it has a whole bunch of secondary means of pushing configuration into it. And so what the parse only tells you is just pull all these options together and show me what you're actually going to run with. Because you may think that you've set an option, but it's being overwritten. We, had, we do have a hierarchy that is documented, but it's an easy thing to mess up. So that's kind of a, a first step in diagnostics. So here we go. This is... <laughs> <laughs> this is me finding that uh, the, the uh, what is it, this is uh, Google Keynotes knockoff, uh, has built-in pictures of clouds, and I was tempted. Uh, so this is a, a pretty standard run. I'm Beaker. I'm running with hosts, so I've described my nodes.config. We'll be looking at that in a few slides. In this case, I've set up a master with three simple agents. And so what this is indicating to you is that on that command line run, it's going to set up your network in whatever cloud or provisioning system that you have selected. Um, it's going to create it all for you, and then it's going to use it. So if you remember from looking at that command line slide, what I'm going through, this is a common workflow if you're actually generating tests. And so the first run you do, you see up there it says dash dash preserve hosts. And what that's telling it is when I'm done testing, don't tear them down. Now, this is important for a lot of our cloud provisioners are incredibly slow in spinning up machines. And if you're working on developing a test, it can be very painful to have to pick them up and then yeah, you throw them away, pick them up, throw them away. It's just a lot of wasted time. So what Perverse, Preserve Hosts tells you is here, I'm using the option always. Uh, you can also set it to on fail. Uh, which is useful for diagnosing test failures. If you think there's something wrong on your network machine, it'll leave it for you on test failure so that you can go and poke at it. So what it's done is it's set up a similar um, cloud configuration. We've got master. We've got our three agents. So the next time we run, we still have, what do we still have? We still have preserve hosts, so we're telling it still don't throw these away but the difference is we're running with no provision. And what's that telling, it, what uh, that is telling uh, Beaker is that both maintain the hosts uh, alive after tests are complete and please reuse them. And that is a lot quicker. <laughs> so at that point, you kind of, you go around in this loop until you're sick of it and then you can always just go back up to the top. And if you run without this no provision option, it'll just automatically throw away what's there and build new. So this is probably kind of a day-to-day -day cycle that you'd go through, you know, many thousand times. 
So when we're talking about what's in that cloud, uh, so internally, obviously, we run a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of supported cloud providers. Um, you'll see that we have Google Compute in there. We use a lot of the uh, Amazon Elastic Computing Cloud. Uh, we have VMware Fusion, vSphere, vCloud, Solaris Zones. Uh, for users outside of our network, um, at the moment what you're stuck with is Vagrant, and I know that that is a pain point. Vagrant is slow, it's difficult, we don't like it. At the moment, uh, I've put down on the bottom here, Docker is the closest. Uh, it's currently in a pull request. So it is currently undergoing review. Um, we do have a member of the community who has successfully set up Docker with Beaker running through Jenkins, and he's doing mass amounts of testing through it. Um, so we're pretty confident that it's gonna be a working option, and we're just waiting for final review and fix up to get that pushed out to the community so that you can have access to that. And that's gonna be a lot better than Vagrant. <laughs> All right, so here I'm just showing when I was talking about the node configuration file. This is an example using Vagrant. Um, we end up using Vagrant examples a lot because it's a really quick and dirty way to get people set up. Because uh, at the moment, uh, Puppet provides a selection of supported Vagrant boxes publicly. So if you go to Puppet Labs Vagrant boxes, or you just look on Google, it will point you to a list of supported Vagrant boxes. We use these internally as well. So these are boxes that we understand, we are maintaining them, and we know that you can run tests on them. Uh, so I think I, uh, yeah, this is not the correct link because <laughs> I wanted it to fit on the screen nicely. So that's a bit of a cheat. Uh, but in this case, you'll see that my top, uh, my Ubuntu box at the top there, it's being described as being the master in this particular network setup. And my hypervisor is indicated as vagrant. Uh, and this guy down here, he's only an agent, and again, hypervisor is vagrant. We do support a number of hypervisor mixes, but it gets pretty complicated. Um, probably for your uses, you're gonna be just sticking to either vagrant or Docker when it becomes available. And so I just wanted to show for comparison, just to show how different host files are constructed. In this case, this is a Google Compute, um, a Google Compute uh, host file. Again, I've got my master up at the top. This time it's a CentOS box. And uh, in this case, what is it? We're indicating that I'm using this built-in image uh, provided by Google. And in this case, for my Debian box, the same thing. I'm saying use Google's image for that. Um, set it up. There's a whole bunch of secondary config. If you've used Google Compute, that probably looks familiar. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of mess. So yeah, these are just examples. Um, there's, been <laughs> there's been some upset that we only really publicly talk about Vagrant, so I'm trying to get kind of more examples out there of how you can set these things up. And coming soon again with Docker, we'll provide again um, set up files. I'm hoping to get our community member who has done his Docker setup to share a lot of information about how he got it up and going, because um, I think he has a really interesting configuration going. Okay, so when we were looking at that host file, um, I kind of, you know, quickly went over that there's, oh, look, there's a master. Oh, look, there's an agent. So these are our role definitions. Uh, when we're talking about that, uh, I, you know, I provided a little description at the bottom. Uh, these are shortcuts to access machines that have particular responsibilities. Um, and you can define them in any way you want. Um, this comes up a lot in the Beaker DSL. Uh, in that case, you can do, you know, I want to run this command on master. So you don't have to remember a host name. You don't have to remember information about the host. You just have to remember which role it occupies. And at that point, you'd be able to access it and run commands on it. So now we're getting more into the nuts and bolts. Um, this is the Beaker DSL. Um, I provided a highlight list here of some of the kind of more commonly run commands that you would see. Uh, the one you really want to highlight on is this on command. Just those two letters. Those are the most important thing probably within Beaker itself. What on says is run this arbitrary command on a host. So if you have anything you want to do, 
anything at all. <laughs> Run it through the on command. Sure, we might have created a nice wrapper somewhere. Maybe you can't find it. Maybe you don't want to figure out how this damn thing runs, and you just want to run like you know a bash script. You can, you can go and pipe it through on, run it on the machine, and check the output from it. So it's, it's, really, it's really the easiest way to get up and running. You can do whatever you are comfortable with as if you are a root user at a terminal. And so I found when I first started to look at the coding of this, because Beaker is kind of an inherited project. It's gone through a few cycles. And when I was first learning about it, all I ever looked at was on. It's, it's your method. It's your best friend. <laughs> You'll see it a lot in the code. Uh, otherwise, you can see that there's some kind of, you know, these are standard wrappers. Um, I want to S copy something to a machine. I want to pull some data off of a machine. You want to do comparisons. Uh, it also provides, it includes all of the Ruby uh, test unit uh, methods. So you can do all kinds of assert commands as well in terms of raising errors when you see something you don't like. So that's also common. Um, kind of the two error states within Beaker are either going to be you run one of these on or puppet or factor commands, and it raises a non-zero return code. And so it would error out automatically in those cases. Uh, if that is not the kind of error you're looking for, you're probably going to be using one of test units uh, assert wrappers. I feel like I'm really blowing through this stuff, so hopefully there'll be questions at the end. <laughs> All right, so here is a very simple look at a test. So this would be a test file. You could go and cut and paste this and just call it test.rb. So you can see that uh, you know, when we're looking at something like this, uh, within the Beaker DSL, we have this test name construct. And so that will show up within your logs, making it really easily readable. That's how we separate out the returned information. So that when you get your statistics about test passed, test failed, that sort of stuff, it'll show up within uh, the, you know, underneath your test name, whatever you happen to have set it as. Um, you can run it with no test name. It's just not very good in terms of your output. It'll be, more, it'll be less readable. So in this case, you know, this is my test, my first step. So again, this is a section of the Beaker DSL that will add a little notation to your output to indicate that you're running a step, whatever you've tended to call it, it'll show up there. And I have my hosts. Beaker provides access to a hosts array um, that you can rotate through. So in this case, I don't really care. I'm not, I'm not looking at a master, an agent, or any of that information. I just want to rotate through all of my available hosts, run my echo command. And if we make it that far, I say, OK, that's great. Then what I want to do on my second step is just on the master. Why don't we say hello there and see what happens? And in this case, maybe I'll even capture the result. And so on my third step, I'm like, well, what happened with my result? Did it actually work appropriately? And so I'm using the test unit construct assert equal and just ensuring that my standard out from that result was the hello that I expect it to be. So this is just a really you know, simple chunk of code. Um, I actually tend to run something similar to this when I'm testing to see if my network is up. I want to make sure all my machines are accessible. They can all kind of wave hello at me. Everything works as expected. So over here, I know it's kind of smushed. This is an actual test we run within our regression testing suite. So this is what real beaker tests look like. Um, and you can see it's not particularly different. Uh, in this case, the bug that we're checking is that when you run M collective, what is it? When you run the M collective process twice in a row, you don't want it to set up a secondary process. So at this point, you can see it's doing this, the same thing we talked about before. It's as, accessing the host array, which is rotating through one at a time. Uh, it has a fancy restart command and a fancy process count check, which I don't really care about. Those can be magic for me right now. And I'm going to say, on my host, run the command, uh, just do a restart. We want to make sure. These people are being extra careful. It will automatically raise an error on a zero ex on a non-zero exit code, but they're going to do an assert equal just to kind of you know fill out the code, make it really clear what they're doing. 
Uh, then they're going to run it a second time, and then they're going to make sure that their process count is correct. And all they're going to do is they're going to run that on each and every one of their hosts. So this is the kind of test that you'd run after you'd done a full PE installation. Uh, you have your M Collective, it's up and running, and you can start running these kinds of checks on it. So this test is included in our suite. Um, you know, this is run many times a day for every one of our releases. And then we can rest assured that, you know, M Collective will never do this secondary start, so you won't fill up your processes. All right, so that was my, <laughs> realizing I talked way too fast, so that was my blisteringly fast, you know, Beaker 101, because uh, I'm already hitting what we're going to be doing next, uh, in the next few months, and the next year. So we already saw this coming up, more hypervisors. Uh, we've heard your cries, you want Docker, Docker is on the list. Uh, OpenStack is next up after that. Um, I'm hoping at that point that we have enough cloud providers to go around. Uh, we'll see if there's maybe some other corporation feels like writing a new one, we'll throw that in too. Uh, and that leads into the second point on this list, which is that we support a lot of cloud providers. It's becoming really confusing and hard to operate within our own testing systems. We have a lot of issues in terms of, oh, damn it. Amazon is down today. Wouldn't it be great if we could just point everything over at Google Compute with a press of one button? We don't have that kind of system in place at the moment. We hard code all of our node configuration information. So if you want it pointed at something else, you're going to have to go through every single host file and update them all. It's an incredibly tedious, laborious process, which means we tend to say, well, you know, let's give it 40 minutes. Maybe Amazon will pick their stuff up and they'll come back. So when we're talking about this pooling API, what that means to us is that we'll have some sort of secondary service running. It will know about all of Beaker's supported hypervisors. It would control where those hypervisors, which ones are being communicated with. So what you would say is that Beaker would only have to say, you know what, I want to do Ubuntu, you know, 64 box, and it would hand one back. And as long as it has network access to that box, it doesn't really care if it's on Amazon, if it's on Google, if it's a vagrant, don't care. I just want the box. So that's kind of the idea here is we're going to have this item that sits in between. We're going to be able to ping it. We're going to get information about it. And then if you want to switch from one to the other, you just send it one command and just say, you know, switch everything or half of it, or, you know, we can get really fancy at that point. So that's what we're aiming for, for an end user who's running Beaker themselves. We're not sure what that's going to look like yet. <laughs> My hope is that you'd probably end up with some sort of pooling API light. You get one that has the built-in um, open source models, the non-pay, so that you could have Docker, Vagrant. You know, even I know that um, you know, quite a few people you know, are willing to pay for EC2. Um, so it would have those built in, it would, it would tr we'd try and make sure that the, um, the setup overhead would be really low. What I don't want is that the beaker setup for an end user gets so onerous that nobody wants to use it. Um, so that's definitely on our minds. Um, because yeah, it's really easy for us to set up a service entirely within our own network. And then say kind of nuts to you guys, you guys figure out your own problems. That is really not the way we're headed. <laughs> so I want to assure you of that first. So the next two really have to do with Beaker coming of age, which is that more people are using it. It's not only a puppet internal piece of code anymore. And it needs best practices and it needs documentation. Because when I'm talking about those test files and I'm like, ooh, you should really put a test name there and you should really you know, wrap items in these step blocks, we don't have anything written that would suggest that that's how a test should be written. We really need to get that written down um, start providing lots of example code. At the moment, the best we can do is say, well, if you go on to GitHub and you look in the Puppet acceptance directory, you'll see all of our tests. So you can go in there and see what other people have written, but a lot of those are not written actually in ways that we support. <laughs> they happen to work, we don't really like it. So we're gonna be moving towards kind of, oh, I'm not plugged in, oh, great. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we're going to be moving towards more of a model where we provide best practices and guides to how to write tests. All right, so I, I talked about this a little bit at the beginning. Um, Hunter's going to be talking after me. So what I have not talked about is Beaker RSpec. Um, Beaker RSpec 
came out of the desire from the Forge module community. They had been using various uh, system testing tools that um, provided uh, access to the RSpec kind of uh, testing language. Um, they were very wary about switching over to Beaker because Beaker basically has, has no construction. You can do whatever the hell you want in Ruby and then throw an assertion. That was not really a good solution for them. They wanted something that had um, a more controlled system, supported the RSpec language, um, and so what we did was we created this shim called Beaker RSpec, and what it does is it connects up the Beaker DSL to RSpec. Um, as a bonus, it provides all of server spec, so woohoo! <laughs> uh, so Hunter's gonna be talking about that. That's just more of where that came from, you know, a general idea of what it does. And I have links here to a lot of the stuff I talked about. Um, so there's the code. At the moment, the wiki is our single source of truth. Um, we are working to get this moved onto docs.puppetlabs.com. That's just gonna take a little while. Uh, at the moment, we do not have an external bug tracker because reasons. Uh, so you can file a bug. I do monitor the issues uh, for Beaker on GitHub. And then we do, uh, we've made great efforts and great strides in terms of documenting the Beaker DSL. And so we do this all in Yard Docs, if anyone's familiar with that. And if you look at this link, uh, you get very pretty documentation that's rather complete for each and every command that Beaker can run. All right, and I think that that's all I have. Wow, that's way faster than I thought it would be. Okay, so I'm sorry if I talk too fast. I don't know if we save questions all the way to the end or? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray for me! Uh, so yes, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to both talk slower and answer them. So, uh, if you're using open source Puppet rather than Enterprise, is there an, an elegant way to get a master setup, or are you just going to be, you know, doing a bunch of on master? Uh, so, uh, so the question is about getting um, a Puppet installation from a non-PE and doing that in an elegant way. And so that comes up with our FOSS testing um, because that is not packaged and we run Beaker against FOSS. And so what they have included within, if you look at um, Puppet acceptance within there, they have a suite that they use as their pre-suite. And so the pre-suite is run before all of the tests. And it goes through all of the installation steps. And it follows uh, Beaker's understanding of the node configuration file. So in that point, you can use the node configuration file with the role definitions and run their pre-suite steps. Um, there are so obviously um, a few extra variables that need to get set, uh, a few more environment variables. Um, I'd be happy, obviously, on IRC to help you out with that uh, in terms of getting it set up. But if you look in, uh, yeah, within their pre-suite, basically, they go through the whole thing. And so they're capable within their Beaker setup of doing arbitrary installs of versions of uh, Puppet, Factor, and Hyra. So they can do all kinds of crazy mixes if they want to. Yeah, I realized that as I was talking about it, that I should have provided a listing of what the test results look like. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit here, Let's see if I can get this to go away now. All right. Let's see if I have some old test results kicking around because all I do is run beaker tests or spec tests, it seems. Okay, so that's tiny a bit. Oh, it's not that bad. Okay, well, it's still a little small. Um, so this is at the end, I've run a single test, so it's not that exciting an output. Uh, but here you can say it attempted, it passed, it failed, it erred. Um, and at that point, it would also give you the listing of the last line of errored or failed tests. Um, so the, the output gets a little bulkier if you have a bunch of errors. It'll just list them all at the end. Um, but this is usually what you'd be seeing. I hope, is that you get, you know, um, you know, 500 attempted and they all passed and everyone's happy. And you can also see down here, it looks like I was running Google Compute when I did this run. 
And so before it shuts down, this is actually its cleanup phase. Um, so again, I'm running with full debug, so it's pretty noisy. Um, so this is it shutting down its Google Compute instances and telling me at the end, oh, I deleted everything from Google, you know, everybody's happy. Yeah, we record it. You can record it, uh, obviously, just to the terminal, or you can specify a file output. Yeah. Uh, mostly what we use these for is that uh, internally all of our tests are run through Jenkins. And so all we're looking for for a Jenkins run is that it's either going to return a zero or a one. Um, and at that point, the Jenkins run will either go green or red. And then we have someone go in, read the entire log, and determine where the test failures are. Um, you can use then various Jenkins add-ons to make the log reading easier. But yes, the logs get pretty long. <laughs> I'm not going to lie about that. Sure. This one's not going to have a very long because I'm obviously doing something very simple here. So yeah, this is actually this is an incredibly short test. I think I was just confirming that I hadn't broken Google Compute. Um, and this is, whoa, all the way up here is the full log. <laughs> so it takes a while to get up here. So this in blue, which is not showing up very well, these are the, um, this is the full configuration that I was running with. So when I was talking about doing parse only, this is the kind of output you'll get. And it shows you everything that Beaker's going to run with. You can see down here, you can see that I have my host configuration. Um, up there, there's a whole bunch of like, do I want to preserve the host? Do I want to throw them away? Do I want to keep this? Um, do I have special SSH instructions I want to give it? And then if you scroll down a bit, then it's starting to say, okay, I'm going to start testing. Uh, I'm going to set up two Google machines. Um, and at that point, this is only validation and configuration of those machines. So it has not even started testing yet. This is just for Google Compute. Um, one of Beaker's assumptions is that it will always be able to log into a machine as passwordless root. This obviously generates some difficulties in writing the tests. Um, I tend to go onto Linux forums, and when I find chunks where people say don't ever do this, it's the most insecure thing ever, that tends to be the solution we want. Because uh, we don't care, they're test boxes, throw them away, make them insecure, don't care. Yes. What? Yes. Yes, it's a passwordless SSH key. I mean, and over here, what am I doing here? So at this point, what I'm doing is that um, this is kind of only for Google Compute. Google Compute allows you to specify um, a user that it will log in as uh, and an SSH key that is by default. And so what I'm doing is I'm logging in. My first run, I'm logging in, and I'm taking its built-in key, and I'm just copying it to root. So that'll allow me to do the passwordless uh, login afterwards. So except that you know a lot of these machines are configured not to allow that. So I'm updating. Where am I doing? I'm updating this sshd config and saying, yes, I really want to log in as root, which I guess is very insecure, and they do not want you to do that. So after I've got the machine configured in such a way that I can log in as passwordless root, at that point it says, I really want curl and NTP date. Um, at that point, it's doing the package installation. So all these boxes also have access to the live web. Um, so it also means that you can, if you have various test data or artifacts that you want to pull in from a local web server, you can do that as well onto the boxes. And at that point, let me see, that one passed successfully. And then it's starting again on my secondary Debian box. So again, we still haven't started any tests yet. It's not till way down here. OK, so I didn't provide it any pre-suite tests. I provided it one test, uh, begin test hostname.rb. And all I am having it do is print out its hostname a few times on both of my boxes. This was actually a patch I was working on today, which was a little confusing in terms of differentiating between host space name and host name, all one word, um, which we want to be different for, again, reasons that are not particularly interesting to an end user. Uh, so that is the only test I'm running. This is my test. 
If any of those had been unsuccessful, it would have gone red here instead of green. So that, you know, for all of that log we saw, that's my test. That's it. And then the rest is all reporting and cleanup, which we saw before. So I hope that answered the question. Or at least made it a little clearer what the reporting's like. OK. Yes, the reporting could be better. Um, we do have the option within Beaker, if you run with dash dash XML, it will, it will also print XML results. And some of our internal uh, Jenkins runs use that. And then we have a secondary parser that will read the XML and report it in different ways. Yeah, anything that's a database or, yeah, anything that's not just a log file. Yeah, I would very much agree. Yeah, it, and it means that at the moment is that we're mostly checking. We assume that everything should pass, so we don't track the status of tests over time. Um, and so at that point, we haven't had much of a reason to go past the log file, because as long as it all goes green, we can ignore it. And then, you know, if we hit a point where we're like, this is a test we know goes red and we want to track it over time or get baselines or you know some back information, then the database is going to become really important. We also generate so much data out of these. We're, we're starting to, um, an internal, um, actually within my team, uh, we have one team member who's exclusively working on uh, Jenkins metrics. And he's working on parsing these logs, starting to pull out information and stick it within a database, um, mostly because We've had some troubles with Jenkins that we generate so much logging and so much information that we're starting to just, we just throw away data after, I don't know, 30 or 60 days. So we actually do not have much history going. And we're going to need to improve on that. Uh, it's actually, it doesn't, it's not um, puppet manifest style. It's just like Ruby. It's just sequential. <laughs> and we're all done. <laughs> You actually, you don't need a master if you're running with a single host. Um, that was just Hunter kind of being a jerk about that. Because uh, for a lot of people's testing infrastructure, uh, say for module testing, they don't actually care to have any network at all. Um, and in that case, they're only, we run master only at that point. Um, so the difficulty is, is I believe you could do that setup. It would get pretty complicated. You'd have to run probably, um, because you're not packaging it all together, um, you'd have to make sure that your master box would be reachable by the network that uh, Beaker would bring up. At that point, you could run on commands on them that would provide a manifest and a means of reaching that master. Um, but you won't get any of kind of the built-in magic. You'd have to do um, a very manual approach at that point. Yeah, yeah, that's what we do again. Actually, one of the first commands we run on these machines is uh, is a, a public Puppet Labs repo that contains a bunch of uh, Puppet employees' keys, and we copy them onto the boxes just as a just as a kind of ease of use, so that anybody would be able to log into them. Um, and that's the same thing, where it's just running a script or running access to GitHub. Uh, there is a built-in into the Beaker D DSL. There's something called, I, I don't remember the exact name, but I think it's run script or run script on. Um, and at that point, you can actually just provide it with a file. Uh, you don't have to run the on command then. It'll just go onto the machine, copy it over for you, and run it. Because it obviously was such a common thing we needed to do, we needed to wrap it up.
Uh, so we do a lot of cheating network-wise. We don't want to wait on DHCP or DNS. Um, so the first steps in a lot of our network setups are hacking Etsy hosts. Um, so at that point, if the machine has an IP address, we can make them all interlink that way. Um, and that has turned out to be the easiest way to get these up quickly and tear them down without having to wait for refreshes within the kind of the network itself. Oh yeah, we, in our vSphere setup, we have a bunch of pre-built templates, um, and so those are what gets pulled in. For the Vagrant stuff, it's so, it's so frustratingly slow because the first run, it pulls in the entire box from Puppet Labs, and then at that point, it, the setup, it, it just churns. I don't know what they're doing there, but it's very slow. All right, I think that's all the questions. Great, thank you.